Once again, thanks for being here, and welcome to Life Bridge. Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome. Good to see you. Happy Sunday. I'm hoping for some snow for Christmas. We don't have any snow, and it's getting close here, and it's going to be a real problem because we all know we'll have it in, like, April, right? So just a little bit for Christmas would be be great, but we're glad you're with uh, with us here today. Thank you for coming to church. We gather together because because the Bible says that, that we should, ultimately, that it, that as Christians, as people who believe in Jesus, we should come together uh, and in community worship our Lord together. And so we do that on Sundays here. And uh, like most churches, we're not that, <laughs> we're not that unique. But, but we're glad that you came and joined us here today. Um, I want to tell you guys about my life bridge. My life bridge is a good way to stay up to date with what we're doing. So um, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of, of different things there that you can find, including our, our daily uh, devotional that goes out every day. Anything upcoming, giving online, stuff that you interact with regularly, you can find all that at mylifebridge.church. Um, there's also cards in the seat backs in front of you that you can use if you want to get connected. You can fill those out, put those in the boxes uh, outside in the hallway, both ends of the hallway. Okay, giving. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for supporting our mission um, with, with your giving. We're talking a little bit more about giving right now because it is the end of the year and we are kind of in a year-end push here. Um, but before I get into those details, I'm going to talk about just how you can give. So you can give online uh, through church. It's very easy to give there. You can give on Venmo. And there's giving boxes. Again, there's black boxes, one outside this door and one up by the lobby, kind of off this hallway. You can, you can drop uh, checks and cash in there. But, but we're asking everybody to help and support what's going on here as we get uh, close to the end of the year. We've set a goal for the month of December of $100,000. We still need 75 of that. So we've got a long ways to go, and we're really, we really need everybody to get involved, and we're asking you guys to be a part of it. Um, what we're going to do, is, if we hit that goal, is it's going to allow us to stay on track for, for where we want to go next year. Uh, we've, been, we've been talking about, we're in discussions about... Um, about exploring hiring a third pastor. That's one of the things we'd love to do. We, we feel like there's a lot of opportunity for discipleship, and that's part of what we're exploring there. And hitting our giving goal is going to allow us to stay on track with that. Then the other thing is our, our, our commitment to the Hulu House. We've been sending money to the Hulu, Hulu House. It's spelled G-L-O. It's pronounced Hulu. They're in South Africa. We've been sending them money uh, every month, and we are going to continue that. And we've got, we've got, uh, just, we've got about uh, another $50,000 or so that we're committed to sending to them over the course of 2022 and 2023. And we want to pay that down as far as we can at the end of this year. Uh, it's important for us, even, even in times when, when maybe we don't feel like there's, uh, there's an abundance, it's important for us still to have, to have an eye to, to the kingdom of God around the world and not just inside these walls here at, at LifeBridge Church. So, so those are kind of the two big things that we're, we're pushing towards the end of this year here that we want to be able to stay on track to do, and we're asking for your help. So please do give. You can do that again online um, through, uh, through Venmo or there's giving boxes here on, on each end of the hallway. With that, um, oh, yeah, one last thing. Sorry, guys. So th- talk t- I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about this weekend. First Christmas Eve, we've got family services this, uh, this Saturday for Christmas Eve. At, sorry, this Friday for Christmas Eve at 4 and 5 p.m. So please come join us at either 4 or 5 for Christmas Eve service. And then, and then one other note is this coming Sunday, we're going to actually have a baptism service. We're baptizing a few people. That's going to be a family service as well, which means no kids ministry. We are going to do one service only next Sunday at 9 a.m. We're gonna do, so that everyone, we want everyone to be together for the baptisms, and uh, we're going to do that next Sunday. So next Sunday, one service only at 9 a.m. We hope that you will uh, come and join us for that as well. Okay, with that, we are going to do something different today. We're going to sing a few Christmas carols before, uh, before Pastor John comes on up. So if you guys would stand and join us as we sing. Again, thanks so much for being here and welcome.
guys can have a seat. Merry almost Christmas, I guess. Hopefully we'll see you Friday, <laughs> Christmas Eve, and I can say Merry Christmas officially to you then. If not, Merry Christmas now. Um, let's pray, and then we'll jump into the sermon. Lord, God, we love you. We praise your name. Thank you, Lord, for Christmas, what we celebrate, for the incarnation, Jesus coming to earth, being made man. Lord, to reveal God to us, to deliver us and save us. Um, Lord, everything that you've accomplished in your life and your ministry here on earth, Lord, we're so grateful, so thankful for you. Help us, Lord, to honor you today in our hearts by worship, in our conversations with one another, and how we listen to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, our mini little Christmas series is called Good News of Great Joy. Um, today we're going to read the text where the angels announce to the shepherds that the birth of Jesus is good news that will cause great joy and be for all the people. So we're going to save that and unpack it on Christmas Eve a little bit, and it will be brief, I promise, because the kids will be in here, and it's Christmas Eve, and you guys want to go home and eat cookies and all that stuff. But it'll be a great time uh, to gather together and celebrate the birth of Jesus as a church community. So we're calling this good news uh, of great joy that will be for all the people. And when we talk about the birth of Jesus being described that way, it truly is, it's good news. And it causes joy, and it's for all people. In our cultural climate today, we tend to, I think if we're honest with ourselves, just uh, find ourselves kind of getting overwhelmed or intentionally pursuing and clicking on stories that do just the opposite of that. Stories that are bad news that causes fear or anxiety or worry and pits some people against others. So this Christmas season, what we want to do is just focus on the good news of the gospel. And I would encourage you as much as possible to just set your mind on things above as scripture tells us to do, to reflect this Christmas season on the incarnation and what it means that Jesus has come to earth. If you find yourself getting overwhelmed, reading news stories about this new variant or what Russia's doing and all of that stuff, just set your mind on things above. Refocus, focus on the good news of Jesus. And that reframes your perspective on life in general and everything. So, that's kind of our emphasis and our focus, but we're going to unpack what it means that Jesus actually came. And we've been going through Luke chapter 1 and 2, looking at the Christmas story. Today we come to uh, the birth of Jesus. So we're going to read that, but we're going to focus most of our time today on what happens with the announcement to the shepherds. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. Most likely, these words will be familiar. We read them every Christmas season <laughs> for good reason. And the reason we do this is because some things are so important in the Christian faith that we need to be reminded of them annually. That's why Christmas and Easter are on the calendar, so that we cannot miss them. We have to return to these. So if you're like, oh, I've heard this before, like that's the point, right? <laughs> you hear it time and time and time again, so this stuff settles in your mind and ultimately in your heart. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So briefly on that, we'll go through this in the devotional a little bit. But it's this event, it's Caesar's decree that leads Mary and Joseph to travel from Nazareth, which we'll see in the next line, leads them to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Okay, Bethlehem is the city where the Messiah was to be born, as prophesied about in the Old Testament, and that is indeed where Jesus was born. So we see in God's sovereignty that Caesar, he uses a decree by Caesar to bring Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem where the Messiah will be born. So what that should emphasize to us is, again, God's sovereignty over all creation, even over the most powerful emperor in the, in the world, the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus. He is orchestrating all things for his glory. And everyone went to their town to register. Oh, so we'll also talk about in the devotional a little bit about the timing of, of this, how God orchestrated the timing of this for the, uh, the Roman Empire, the Pax Romana, for what that meant for 
the spread of the gospel and how God had just planned and orchestrated the Messiah to come at the perfect time in history, used uh, Caesar, Augustus, and the Roman world, and all that. It's, it's so cool. It, you guys are less excited than I am, but it's very cool, okay? You should be excited about it, too. So, Joseph also went out from in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Emphasize time and time and time again throughout these first two chapters of Luke. Okay, we get it, Luke. Uh, <laughs> Joseph is from David's line. You keep saying this over and over and over again. He's emphasizing the point that Jesus is the Messianic prof king who was prophesied about in the Old Testament to come from the line of David to establish his throne forever. Okay, Jesus is the Messiah, is what Luke is like, just red lights blaring. Right? He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. So, the theme that we should be seeing coming up here in this section is the humility of Jesus. We sang about it just a moment ago, that this birth narrative, all of it, now he's going to announce it to shepherds. Remember, God calls Mary to this task in Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Um, it's out in the country, far away from the religious epicenter of Jerusalem. And God here is using humble people to bring about his will. And so what we're seeing is this message is for all people. That this Messiah, this king, he wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born in luxury to all the wealth and privilege. He was born in a manger in a small, tiny little, like, tent community of Bethlehem. And there wasn't even room for him <laughs> to be at the inn. And he was placed in a manger, like a feeding trough for animals. All right? So what we're seeing is the humility of Jesus, the humility of our Savior, our Messiah. And it doesn't stop there. That theme continues with this announcement to the shepherds. It goes on, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Okay, so if we were in the first century, and I read this and said there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, you would probably say something like, ew. All right, so let's practice. And there were shepherds. Ugh. Good job. Yeah, nice. Well done. Okay, so shepherds were of the lowest class of society in the first century. Uh, they held no respect in the culture. One, their job was just really easy and crazy boring. Okay, this is like the most unskilled job that one could have. You sit out in the field, and if a wolf or something comes, usually you just scare it away by whatever, swinging a, your stick at it. It's usually fairly easy, fairly easy job. Nothing usually happens. Um, they're of the lowest class in society. They even usually missed out on the religious ceremonies um, that took place in Jerusalem because somebody's got to watch the sheep. And somebody's got to stay back and take care of the animals. Uh, their testimony was not permissible in court even. So no respect, zero, none whatsoever. Keep that in mind, especially that their, their testimony was not permissible in court. It's very interesting why God would choose to announce to people whose testimony isn't allowed in court, the birth of the king, the Messiah. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news, here's our line, that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Okay, we'll unpack this a little bit more in the devotional as well. Uh, announcement of how they describe Jesus. He is the Savior. We've been talking about this for the last two weeks. That in, in this concept of Savior and salvation, that's kind of what the word Jesus, the name Jesus, means. Is he's a Savior. That he brings deliverance, salvation. He, he restores our right relationship to God. He restores our relationship to one another. And he restores the relationships amongst all of creation. Is what the word Savior implies. He is the Messiah. Okay, the angel just says it specifically. So it's not just Jesus claiming this about himself. The angels have made this claim about him. 
Again, born in the city of David. He is the Messiah, the king. Uh, the Old Testament is prophesied about in the line of David that his throne will exist forever and it will have no end. And he is the Lord. The word Lord there is curious. Most likely, it, it could just imply a uh, lordship, that Jesus has an authority over all people. But in the Old Testament, the personal name of God, Yahweh, was deemed to be t uh, out of respect for that. They wouldn't say it. So what they started saying was the word Adonai, okay, which means Lord. So then culturally, it just kind of picks up that when you say Lord, you're referring to God. And we even see this in Mary's song. Uh, in Zechariah's song too, I believe, he refers to God the Father as Lord. So what the angel may be implying here is that Jesus is God. So what we see in the first, in the announcement of his birth is God visiting humanity, the dual nature of Christ as fully God and fully man, even in the term Lord. So if you hear people say, Jesus never claimed to be God, ah, not true, right? This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So, again, in the devotional, we'll cover this. Why in verse 14 is different if you memorize it in the King James Version, where it says, uh, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, good will towards men. Okay, it's different. Right? It's different than peace on earth to those on whom his favor rests. The NIV translation here is almost certainly the accurate one, and I'll kind of go through why. But if you like the nostalgia of the King James, I guess you can, you can go with that. But <laughs> this is more likely the accurate translation, and I'm going to preach this text as if this were the accurate translation. So he, the angel announces this as God's space, glory to God in the highest heaven. So God is glorified in the highest heaven in God's space where he exists and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So in God's space, there's glory to him on earth here, those on whom God has bestowed his favor, like the choice of Mary, uh, like his chosen people, Israel, and, and now in the New Testament era, those who are among the followers of Jesus, those who are among the elect, those whom God has chosen, those are the ones on whom his favor rests. And he declares peace upon them. And again, peace is this concept of shalom that we've been talking about over the last few weeks. It, again, implies peace among all of creation, restoration of right relationships. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. That one line in verse 19 that leads most scholars to believe that Luke has Mary as his primary source for all of these events. Okay, how else would he know this, right? <laughs> so, so Luke is uh, traveling around the known Roman world, and he interviews, he's putting this story together for Theophilus, okay, who's a Greek, wealthy benefactor, and he's likely interviewing Mary to get all of this information. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. All right, so here's, here's how we're going to apply this. I'm just going to briefly walk through this now, and then when I come back up later, I will uh, we'll go through this in more detail. But in the shepherds here what is just a brief, a quick glimpse model of discipleship. So we see, one, they were chosen by God. Okay, there's... <laughs> they were chosen by God to be the ones to whom God would reveal the birth of the Messiah, the King, God in flesh. God could have chosen any other person <laughs> in the surrounding region, in the area, anyone with more influence uh, to go out and bear witness to the name of Jesus and the birth of the Messiah. But he chose shepherds whose testimony was not even admissible in court, who everybody looked down upon. Band, you guys can come on and get set up. So they were chosen by God. 
they hear the word of God. So the angel announces it to them, and they take that as the word of God. Say, so let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that the Lord has told us about. Then they, they obey it. So they hear God's word through the angels, and then they obey the word, and they follow through. And they go, and uh, so they go in and to Bethlehem to see what the angel, the Lord, had told them about. Then they find the word of God to be true, right? They find the baby, they find Joseph, they find the baby lying in a manger, and it is exactly as the angel had told them. And then they return worshiping God, and they give him praise and glory. They glorify him and praise him, and they share the good news about God. They go around and tell everybody what they saw, and the people were filled with amazement at the words of the shepherds. So what we see here is just this brief, really quick snapshot model of discipleship. I often get the question of what does discipleship mean? People, we hear that word in our culture, and we're like, I don't know what we're talking about <laughs> when we talk about discipleship. These are major blocks in our discipleship to Christ. Uh, this isn't all of it, but this is pretty important stuff, all right? So what we're going to do is just kind of go through this. I'm going to ask you later on in the service, does this characterize your discipleship to Jesus? What aspects of this are missing or lacking in your discipleship to Christ? Let's pray. Lord, God, we thank you again for coming to earth to reveal to us what it means to be right with God, for being our Savior, our Messiah, for being the Lord. Jesus, we thank you for who you are, and we give you praise and worship and adoration. So Lord, be honored and glorified as we sing to you now. But most of all, Lord, be honored in the disposition of our hearts of worship and surrender to you. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. And while we're singing, there's prayer available in the back. I encourage you to receive prayer.
darkest hours on our hardest days, we do not have to be afraid. You will never leave, you will not forsake the promises you have made. private worship, our day to day, may it be honoring to you. Spirit of God, draw us into times of quiet, peace, where we open your word, where we meditate on your scripture, where we listen to your spirit. Lord, we give you worship, the adoration that you deserve. Lord, you calm our minds. You give us a glimpse of shalom, what it means to be in right relationship with you. Lord, inspire us through your word, through those times with you, to pursue reconciliation, right relationships with one another this morning. And in our love for each other, bring you honor and glory and point to you, Jesus, magnifying you, Lord. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. All right, for a few moments, we're just going to unpack a little bit about this model of discipleship that we see in the shepherds here. First and foremost, they were chosen by God. Now, I know when I say that language, it's really... <laughs> complicated position that it puts me in because uh, if you're familiar with the theological discussions around Calvinism, Arminianism, determinism, free will, then you're like, whoa, okay, I'm like going too deep. And if you're not, you're like, what the heck is he talking about? And you just feel weird, okay? So I'm going to keep it brief and whatever. Uh, basically, whether you're Calvinism, you're Calvinist or Arminianist or uh, don't know, in some sense, you were chosen by God, okay? Scripture is clear whether God chose you because he foresaw into the future that you would choose him or for some other reason based on your faith, or he just chose you and saved you, 
The difference is simply in who takes initiative. Does God take initiative in choosing you and saving you, or did you take initiative in choosing God and saving him er, and, and seeking out him? It doesn't really matter for this case because both both have to wrestle with all of the biblical language around the elect or those who have been chosen by God. So in some sense, you were chosen by God. And in this story, God just chooses to reveal to shepherds that uh, the birth of the Messiah has taken place. And remember, these guys, their testimony wasn't even admissible in court. So if they go around telling people what they saw, their reaction would likely be, sure, sure, sure. You guys aren't educated. You have no clue what you're talking about. Why would we believe you? Okay, this is similar to uh, the resurrection. Okay, Jesus first is revealed after the resurrection to women, who their testimony wasn't admissible in court in this day and age either. So God has an affinity for choosing to declare his message or the beauty of what he is doing to people who in this culture, in this society, were looked down upon. This is just what God does. He's famous for it throughout all of Scripture, and God loves choosing lowly shepherds throughout all of Scripture. If we think back into the Old Testament, we see God calling Moses. So after Moses was prince of Egypt and all of this, he kills somebody, he leaves. This is a very rough summary, okay? <laughs> you should read it, all right? I'm assuming everybody's seen Prince of Egypt, right? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Read it in the Bible. Um, so after he, he flees Egypt and he goes out to Midian, he's a shepherd for his father-in-law, Jethro, taking care of sheep. And it's there that he encounters the burning bush where God calls him to go back into Egypt and to deliver his people. So Moses was called out of being a shepherd as well. Think of King David. When Samuel comes to find, the, find Israel's next king, whom God has called, he goes to Jesse's house. And David isn't even invited to the party. Right? The, Jesse's like, there's no way it's him because he's the youngest. He's out watching sheep. Okay, this was the job for the youngest. If you're the youngest in the family, you get it. Okay, I get it. Right? Send him. Right? So he's, he's out watching sheep. He's not even invited. And guess what? He's the one whom God has anointed and called. He is the next king of Israel, and he becomes the greatest king of Israel. So, so far we have the greatest prophet in Israel's history and the greatest king in Israel's history called out of being shepherds. And lesser known, Amos was also a shepherd, the minor prophet. So God is famous for this. This is what he does. He elevates lowly shepherds, and he dignifies them by giving them this grand mission and this grand calling. And these shepherds were the first evangelists to the gospel of Jesus. So what we should be seeing here is that no human being is outside of being able to be a part of God's community and God's people. That anyone from lowly shepherds to priests, <laughs> from kings to slaves, can be a part of the people of God. What Jesus brings and what this new gospel is all about is everybody, without distinction, is included, can be included in the people of God. Whether they have no money to speak of, they have tons of money, great power, no power, social status, no social status, God redeems all types of people. So what this means for us is that you are not outside no matter who you are, no matter your history, no matter your past, you can be a part of the people of God. That there is no exclusion based on all of these former uh, dividing lines, dividing walls of hostility, the Apostle Paul calls them. Jews, Gentiles, slave, free, barbarian, Scythian, male, female, all are in Christ. I love how C.S. Lewis says it. So one, that's it. Is you're not, you, based on all of those like social categories and distinctions that we like to divide people by, you're not outside of the people of God. Number two, this application means that, hey, you have never met an ordinary person, as C.S. Lewis says. That in this gospel community that Jesus calls us to, we are called to dignify even the lowliest of people. 
whom so our culture has ostracized and looks down upon. So that should be a part of our regular day, our regular rhythm, is showing people the dignity that God has given them and loving people. Because God is famous for elevating the lowly. And so as people who are called by his name, that is our responsibility as well, to dignify all types of people. So they're chosen by God. Next, they hear the word of God. So they listen to the word of God revealed to them by the angels. So for us today, what does it look like for us to hear the word of God on a regular basis? Are you reading scripture daily? You're here. Great. So you're hearing the word of God preached in community. Good job. Listening to sermons online, listening to good content, studying scripture, reflecting on it, contemplating it, memorizing it being engage, engaged in the Word of God daily. That's why we do five-day-a-week devotional, because it's so important that we're in God's Word on a daily basis. But we're not just to be hearers of the Word, as James says. We are to be doers of the Word as well. So it's not just enough to hear it and to read it on a daily basis. You have to conform your life to it. And this... I think is the big challenge. <laughs> this is where the challenge uh, sets in for most of us. So if you're an individual who is like hearing, reading the word of God, engaging with it daily, attempting and trying to conform your life to it, and you're, you're facing the struggles of that that is on a daily basis, your regular failures, your regular falling, like, good, that's great. Keep struggling, keep wrestling with it, keep seeking the Holy Spirit to help and to guide you in that. Um, but just for a moment, I just want to talk to, to those of you who are uh, more in the vein of like, I'm hearing it, but I'm not even trying. I don't want to obey it for one, word, one reason or another. Despite the fact that Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, you will obey my commands. <laughs> so if we love Jesus, it should be just a regular outflowing of our love for him, that we do what he says. When we talk about discipleship, as this being a model of discipleship, what is discipleship if not obeying our teacher's words, right? Obedience is something we don't like to talk about, but it's everywhere in Scripture. And I'm not just talking about the ethical imperatives of, of Jesus. I'm talking about his entire way of life, okay? Being a disciple means you adopt his entire way of life. This is how we achieve the fullness of life that Jesus has promised us, is by adopting his entire way of living. That means his model of prayer, that means his models of elevating the humble and the lowly and spending time with them. That means his model of humility, like he gives here, all of it. The entire way of Jesus is to be our model for life. And I think a lot of times we hear the words of Jesus and, and we either don't understand it or we don't see why or we disagree with it in the moment. Uh, we don't see how this is going to achieve the outcome that we want. And so, we just don't do it. <laughs> I'm reading uh, a book right now with Shiloh. It's a little kid's book. My son, he's eight. We're going through Pilgrim's Progress. It's a little kid's version of it, and we're reading through it together. And I love the story because the allegory is a little on the nose for me. It's a little much, all right? I mean, the character's name is Christian, right? It's like, come on. Come on, Bunyan. Um, but anyways... <laughs> A little more creativity guy. Um, so he, <laughs> it's very creative. I'm kidding. I couldn't write that. Um, so he's, his name is Christian, and he's just, he's given one step at a time. So says, get to the gate, and you'll be told what to do. <laughs> Cross, go through um, Vanity Fair, and here's what might happen in there. Here's the instructions that you need to get through there, and that's it. And he gets through, and then he receives another set of instructions. And the point is, we, we don't have to have the whole picture. You will never have the whole picture. You don't see the big picture of everything that is going on in your life and the lives of people around you and the lives of loved ones. You, you don't have it, and you never will. So your job is not to have it all figured out. Your job is not to determine all outcomes. Your job is, as Anna says in Frozen, do the next right thing. <laughs> It's brilliant. That's a brilliant piece of advice, by the way. 
Your job is to obey the words of Jesus, even if you don't get it, even if you disagree with it in the moment. Dallas Willard says, the secret to peace as apprentices of Jesus have long known is being abandoned to God. And what he means is surrendering to God's will. And to be surrendered to his will means that we obey the word of God, even if we don't get it, even if we disagree with it, even if we don't think that it will achieve the outcome that we want. John Tyson talks about, uh, well, Henry Nouwen was famous for, uh, he took like trapeze lessons when he was older and retired. He's a brilliant scholar and he took like insane, right? Trapeze? Why? He was fascinated by it. It's super weird. But John Tyson talks about it in <laughs> his book, The Burden is Light. And he ended up taking trapeze lessons as well for this reason, because it's a profound what he understood and what he grasped from it. Uh, he, in doing so, Tyson discovered the secret of the whole thing. So the one guy's like flying on a rope, and the other guy flies, and one like lets go, and the other guy catches him, right? And like, how does that happen? And what he learned as he was taking these lessons is that there's a director, that there's somebody outside that has the perspective to see what is happening, to get the timing right for everything that needs to take place. Because when you're swinging on a rope, you can't pay attention to everything. You don't know what your partner's doing across the way. You can't see everything. So there's somebody else who's outside viewing the whole thing from a distance who gives them cues of when to let go and when to start. And all of that stuff. And that's a beautiful picture of discipleship to God. Is that when we're in the midst of life right now, we don't have the whole picture. Okay, We don't know what God is doing all around us all the time. We can't. We don't have that perspective. But he does. And so when he gives us the cue, <laughs> our job is to listen. And if we don't, and we don't obey his word at the right time, we're missing the fullness of life that God has called us to. So, we hear the word of God, we obey the word of God. And then next, we find the word of God to be true when we do. <laughs> this is one of those uh, arguments that may not be convincing if you haven't been living the way of Jesus for a while. But if you have, you know it to be true. That the things Jesus does promise, he truly gives when we live his way. And the more we live in them, the more we find them to be true. So what we find in our culture is things like, <laughs> that just seems so counterintuitive. Everywhere in the culture, we hear things like, stand up for your rights, fight for your rights, don't tread on me, don't let anybody put you down, get even. But then we read the words of Jesus, and this is, goes back to the obeying, hearing and obeying the words of Jesus as well. Things like turn the other cheek. Things like forgive as you have been forgiven. Things like pray for those who persecute you. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. We read all of these things, and they're so counterintuitive and countercultural that until you practice them and experience them and actually try them, they don't make sense. But after you've been living it for a while, you realize, oh my goodness, Jesus was right. And you find it to be totally true. Culture tells us, do what makes you happy. Take control of your destiny. Jesus says, surrender to the will of God. And when we do, what we end up finding is maybe not the wealth, maybe not the luxury, the, the unending happiness that we are all kind of pursuing. We find something much better and much deeper. We find things like peace. We find things like joy. Like love. Contentment, purpose, and hope. And those things are far better than anything that the world has to offer. So we find them to be true, and then we worship. <laughs> what else would we do <laughs> in response to the great grace of God that we have been shown? 
We glorify, we praise, not just here, but every day of our life. Every act. Going to work becomes an act of worship to God. As Mary sings in her song, my soul magnifies the Lord. Every aspect of us just makes Jesus look awesome. Makes him look great. The way we live our lives, the way we talk to one another, the way we choose to spend our money, the way we dignify people, even the lowliest of people. And then we share the good news about God. Shepherds, remember, we're the first evangelists whose testimony wasn't even admissible in court. I'm not going to get into this because <laughs> there's a million. I wrote down like five different books that I've read on evangelism. Okay, Read them if you want. Use them if you want. Go for it. But whatever you do, be willing to share the gospel of Jesus at all times and sometimes with words. I forget who said that. That came to me. Was it Ignatius? Whatever. Um, it'll come later. Or somebody, you can tell me after service. Um, share the gospel always and sometimes use words. So, just be willing to share Jesus. That means being engaged in regular life rhythms with people who don't know Jesus. So whatever that looks like for you, evangelism gets weird when you are not engaged in regular life with people who don't know Jesus, that's where Christians get weird when it comes to evangelism. Just live life with people who don't know Christ and be willing to share Jesus with your actions and your words. So what I want us to do for just a moment here is look up at this list and go through each one. Say, for some of you, if, if this characterizes your discipleship to Christ, if my guess is for many of you, one or two or a few will be missing from your discipleship to Christ. And you probably know when you're looking at it, which one you're resisting. Uh, stop resisting would be my encouragement to you. Make that a part of your regular life rhythm in your discipleship to Jesus. For those of you whom this is all a part of your regular rhythm, pick one that you're lacking. Pick one that just hasn't been an emphasis for you, and emphasize it over the next week or so. So when we talk about being chosen by God, again, those big things of identity and purpose and calling, those are huge. If we don't have that concept of being chosen by God and responding in worship, that changes how we worship. Wrestle with that. Think on that. Hearing the word of God, engaging in, with scripture on a daily basis. Obeying the word of God. Are you struggling to surrender to the will of God in your life? Finding the word of God to be true. On that note, I would encourage you to journal. If you've never tried journaling before, journal on how you have seen God's word to be true in your life and how you have seen it come uh, to fruition. So that there are times when you're not seeing it happen, you can look back and see what God has done in the past. Worship, public and private worship, and sharing the good news. Are you talking about Jesus in your regular life? So just take a moment, look at those, reflect, pray on which one you need to add to your life rhythm or which one you can emphasize. And when you pick one, reflect on, just imagine yourself doing it over the next week, okay? <laughs> just sit with God, close your eyes, do whatever you need to do, and just imagine the times that you're going to add this to your rhythm and imagine what it's going to be like. And I think that'll help you put it into practice. We want to be better disciples of you. We want to adopt your whole way of life. So, Lord, in these very basic, very simple ways that we can follow you, Jesus, simple in theory, difficult in practice, Lord, would your spirit guide us?
guide us to adopt your whole way of life, Jesus. Not just think of the gospel as a get out of hell free card, but Lord, to live in the fullness of life that you have given us by following you in all things. So Jesus, convict us where it's needed, encourage us where it's needed, but Lord, guide us to be disciples of you who are fully committed to your way. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing one more song before we close. God, help us to learn from the example of the shepherds, Lord. And God, as we move towards Christmas, as we, um, we reflect on who you are and, and Jesus, what it meant for you to come to earth, Lord, help us to be humble, and gentle, and lowly in how we represent you, Lord. Help us to follow you, Jesus. Um, follow after the example of the shepherds and how we follow you this week. 
We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much for being here. You have a wonderful week.